So today we're going to, um, I'm not going to speak all day, which is a delightful change of pace for those of you who have been doing this with me for many, many years. Um, but thank you for coming. Welcome to the first workshop. We'll be holding one of these in each of the four counties. And we're going to spend some, um, spend some time walking through the entire project selection process so you'll get a full er overview of um, all of the processes that we'll be doing. We will spend some more focused time today on the regional competition for our Federal Highway Administration funds. And then Mitch is going to walk you through our online system. So we have um, online resources, some applications, a lot of guidance materials, and he'll walk you through uh, that information and how to um, use the system to fill out your application. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Thank you. So as part of this process, we actually have four concurrent competitions that are happening. Uh, for FHWA funds, there's a regional competition, and then there's uh, four separate competitions for the uh, four countywide groups. For FTA, there's a regional competition as well as an earned share distribution process. Um, and we're going to dive into each of these a bit here in a bit. Um, combined, these programs uh, equal approximately $533 million. Uh, and you can see the breakout between each of the competitions here on the slide. Um, and also it's worth noting that we have these other uh, PSRC funding programs, but those competitions are conducted separately in off years, um, and they're more on an uh, ad hoc basis. All of our processes will follow the policy direction laid out in our fr uh, policy framework for PSRC's federal funds. They must be consistent with regional policy and local comprehensive plans. Uh, Kelly likes to use a funnel metaphor. Um, so we have um, kind of at the top of the funnel, you have vision um, that feeds into the regional transportation plan and also feeds into local comprehensive plans. And all of that work funnels down into this project selection process. Uh, so Kelly likes to refer to this process as being the bottom of the funnel. Where, um, but so then um, you'll also notice, I just want to point out that this 2020 framework is based on vision 2040 policies. Um, this is because Vision 2050 will not be, uh, it won't be going to the General Assembly for approval until later this year. Uh, so for this process, we'll be using Vision 2040. Uh, federal, federal and state regulations require the process to be competitive. There are specific eligibility, eligibility requirements for each program. And the awarded phase must be fully funded. The policy framework for PSRC's federal funds is adopted prior to each funding cycle. The funds are awarded every two years and program, uh, programming the funds into the future. So it's worth noting that uh, for this 2020 process, the funds that will be awarded are for uh, federal fiscal years 2023 and 2024. The framework uh, continues the support for centers in the quarters that serve them policy. And the overall pro framework provides board direction for how projects are selected and lays out the policies and procedures for how the process will be conducted. So this slide shows some of the key elements that make up the policy framework. Uh, this includes the estimates for the various PSRC uh, funding sources, the FT FHWA and FTA funds, uh, the set-asides, uh, we have preservation, bike bed, uh, bike bed uh, and as well as the minimum floor for the FTA earned share process. It also includes the project evaluation criteria and other administrative details. We're going to go into more detail on some of these elements later in the workshop. But you can also find more information in the call for projects materials on our website. Um, and we'll also point out where you can find that uh, later in the workshop. For the policy focus, we, uh, I mentioned earlier that the policy focus of this project selection process is on uh, centers and the quarters that serve them. For, FH, for the FHWA regional competition, centers are defined as the regional growth and manufacturing industrial centers. For all other processes, the definition is expanded to include uh, locally identified centers. Uh, it's also worth noting that for the FHWA countywide competitions, uh, military facilities are included as locally identified centers. There are different eligibility requirements for each of the federal fund sources that make up the competition. The Surface Transportation Program, or STP, is the most flexible funding source and can be used to fund roadway, transit, ped bike, uh, freight projects, et cetera. 
there is a minimum amount that is required to be spent in rural areas. And it's important to note that this minimum amount is separate from the rural town centers and corridors program. The Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program, or CMAC, funds projects that provide air quality benefits. It's important to note that general purpose capacity projects are ineligible for this funding source. And both STP and CMAC require a 13.5% local match. Good morning, so I'll be providing a very brief high level overview of the Federal Transit Administration funding processes. But as a reminder, we do have a session coming up at 11 where we'll be going into much more detail on the FTA side of uh, the, uh, the project selection. So for the FTA funds, they can only be used for projects that are transit related, although there is a lot of flexibility in the type of transit related activities they can be used for. Um, the, the funds can go to both transit agencies and local agencies. Local agencies do need concurrence from a transit agency. As an example of a local agency using uh, the FTA funds, an access to transit project that is within a, the catchment area of a transit stop or station is eligible for FTA funds. There are four specific funding programs. That's Section 5307, Urbanized Area. A section five through three seven a high intensity fixed guideway and a high intensity motor bus, and then section five through three nine uh, bus and bus facilities. And we have available the eligibility information on our website as well as part of the call for projects with with much more detail. Uh, for the FTA funds, a twenty percent match is required, which is slightly higher than the FHWA thirteen point five, and that is for all the FTA funding programs. So. At the very high level, the FTA process is that we have three urbanized areas within the Seattle, the PSRC region. That's Bremerton, Marysville, and Seattle Tacoma Everett. How the funds come to the region is that Congress out allots a certain amount to each of the funding programs. And then the FTA uses national formulas to distribute them across the country. Part of that formula is based on earned share characteristics that are like operating characteristics and service provided by all the transit agencies within the UZA. Those funds go to the earned share distribution and the remaining funds come based on regional attributes that apply to the entire region, like population density or the low income population. And those funds go to the regional competition and the, another part goes to the preservation set aside and the minimum floor set aside. And those uh, categories only apply to the Seattle Tacoma Everett UZA, for the Bremerton and Marysville UZAs, we only use the earned share distribution because each UZA only has one transit agency. Because Seattle Tacoma Everett has multiple transit agencies, there's both an earned share distribution and a regional distribution. For the FHWA funds, um, the project selection process uh, are, is split between a regional competition and countywide competitions. A limited number of applications can be submitted to the regional competition. Um, and as you can guess from the name, uh, the projects are competing in the forum should have a regional focus. The countywide competitions are ref reflective of the priorities within each of the counties, but are still consistent with the policies and procedures that are laid out in the, in the uh, framework. The preservation and bike ped set-asides are distributed through the countywide process, and the rural, the rural minimum is also a part of that, the countywide processes. For both the regional and countywide competitions, projects can apply for um, either just a single phase or for preliminary engineering in the subsequent phase, so either PE and right away or PE and construction. So for the project evaluation criteria, um, it includes the support for centers, safety and mobility and accessibility, uh, population served, health and equity considerations. Uh, emissions reductions, CMAC includes the cost effectiveness of the project, uh, project readiness and financial plans, uh, non-scored elements include innovations and cost benefit and practical design and project considerations. And so also for the county-wides, um, it's important to note that they can further tailor this uh, criteria uh, to meet their needs. And we're gonna dive into this more uh, in a few uh, slides. So PSRC has a project tracking program that we've had in place since 2003. Uh, the region has gone or ha went many years with a large backlog of projects to deliver. Uh, we were lagging behind along with other local projects from across the state. Um, but we've made tremendous strides over the years to clear out that backlog. 
In 2013, a new rule required the region to start meeting annual targets for delivery, uh, for delivery of the FHWA funds specifically. If we don't meet these targets, we risk losing those funds. So the overall goal of PSRC's project tracking program is to ensure the efficient use of PSRC's funds. And so these project tracking policies have evolved over the years, um, and they include the following elements. Uh, for one, there's twice a year progress reporting for all active PSRC projects, including those that haven't started yet. So it's important to note that when you apply for PSRC funds, the moment you get those funds is when you start reporting on that project, even if you haven't started the first phase. We use this as a way to be able to track um, to see, to make sure that these projects are on track to be obligating those funds, even if it's just obligating PE or a planning phase. Uh, let's see, the project tracking policy specific to FHWA funds include a June 1st obligation deadline. So if you're awarded 2023 or 2024 funds, those project, the obligation deadline for those funds will be June 1st of that year. Each project award is tied to a specific year. So again, 23 or 24 funding. Um, I also just want to take a moment to note that these funds are federal funds, and so they're tied, even though we, our TIP is based off of a calendar year, the funds are tied to a federal fiscal year. So they become available October 1st of the beginning of that federal fiscal year. So if you have 2023 funds, those funds actually become available in October of 2022. Um, and so 2024 funds would be available in October of 2023. So the project tracking policies also provide an opportunity for a one-time extension. Uh, we're gonna get more into this on the next slide. Uh, but if funds are not used by a deadline, they will be automatically returned. We have this use it or lose it policy uh, because the region has an annual delivery target that equals our annual allocation of federal funds. And if projects don't deliver on time, we have to reprogram the funds to, to a project that is able to deliver them so we don't risk losing those funds um, by, the, by the end of the federal fiscal year. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Monica, can you turn your mic on for the folks on the phone? Sorry about that. Um, so when you were referring to um, when the funds will be available, is it not true that the funds would be in, approved in the STIP in January 21, and that would be like the pre-award authority date or when you can start um, I guess, spending or incurring costs? So I can't speak to the FDA program, but for the highway program, the, the, the TIP itself, the new TIP will be developed and approved in January, but the funds, the federal highway funds are certainly tied to a fiscal year and they won't be available until that. For federal transit administration funds, I think, and this is probably, um, I'm, I'm not suited to best talk about them, but for many of the folks around the room, it probably won't apply to their projects, but if the transit agency or the projects have pre-award authority, there there's probably a, a different provision where you can incur costs, but that doesn't apply to the highway funds. Okay, thank you. And Monica, thank you for jumping in and asking a question, because I realized I did not say that. If at any point you all have any questions, just um, feel free to uh, turn your mic on and, and we can go, go along. Uh, so we continue to meet this, uh, our delivery target every year, but sometimes it takes an extraordinary effort. Uh, so we worked with RPEC and the countywide forums to, to pro, uh, for some proposals to be more efficient and continue to encourage delivery. Uh, so these recommendation, recommendations went to PSRC's boards, and the executive board adopted these, uh, updated, up, I'm sorry, adopted these updated project tracking policies earlier this year when they approved the framework. With these updated policies, FHWA, for FHWA funds, um, the obligation deadline extensions will no longer be automatically granted. Uh, but instead, there's a list of reasons why extensions won't be granted. Um, so for this list includes uh, shifting priorities for the agency, insufficient funding, a lack of a CA sponsor, or that the work wasn't begun in a, in a reasonable time period. And by this, we mean that the, the previous um, phase or milestones weren't begun um, in a time that could have reasonably anticipated being able to obligate the following phase on time. Um, so with this, we also, uh, the policies have been updated to include two tiers for extensions. The first one is a 45 day extension provided for the portion of projects each year that just need that short amount of time uh, to be able to obligate the funds. 
Uh, so this provides a 40, 45 day extension, but still will obligate the funds within the, the current uh, federal fiscal year. A one year extension is provided to allow more time for projects that need that more significant extension, but this extension will push it out in the ne uh, next federal fiscal year. Um, and because this is a more substantive extension, uh, it requires board approval. So if you need more than that 45 day extension, this would be something that will have to go to PSRC's boards to get approval. Um, that's a significant change from the current policy, which before was just handled with at the PSRC staff level in consultation with uh, our countywide chairs. And I'm gonna pause here because um, we've been working on this for many months and our, the, those of you who work with us on a regular basis have been working on this for many months, but I see some new faces. So I think this is worth just pausing for a moment and maybe, maybe I'll just do a quick recap and see if there's any questions. So um, a lot of these have to do with our Federal Highway Administration funds, which presumably that's what most of you are here for. We are gonna be talking about our Federal Transit Administration funds in greater detail at 11 but the project tracking requirements in general apply to all funding sources. Um, there are still project tracking uh, requirements for our FTA funds, but they are, they are a little different. And we're spending a lot of time on the FHWA because FHWA, we do have that annual delivery target. So just a, a quick recap, because Ryan, Ryan said a few key points and I wanna hammer on them. There is a June 1st obligation date, but as he pointed out, you don't have to wait until June 1st to obligate. Your funds would be available um, starting the previous October. So because we've had such a hard time delivering in this region, we go to extraordinary lengths to make sure that we meet our target. And it's um, a lot of work on everybody and we have to deviate sometimes from the process to make that happen. So we're going to a lot of effort to encourage folks to, especially during project selection, really look at your schedules, really look at the resources available. Don't necessarily plan on waiting until June to obligate your funds. But if you do run into a problem, there is a provision where you can get a bit of an extension. And Ryan mentioned, we do see um, not an insignificant number of sponsors where they're, they're on track, they're, they're nearly there, they just need a little bit of time. And that's why the July 15th um, buffer is provided. But for those that in, in the up till now, we've seen a little bit of a reliance on our extension process. And with these new policies, that's, that's a shift. So the board doesn't necessarily want to see them. So that's why we're saying if you if you do run into a problem and there's a, a, a valid reason why the project is delayed, you can certainly request an extension, but just know it's not automatically granted and the, it will be going to PSRC's policy boards and they, they are very rigorous in their review. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, cause we go, we go back and forth. We've got a, a number of different funding sources, but the, the truly rigorous policies are on our highway funds because we have such um, heightened delivery expectations. Okay. That's my, that's my soapbox. <laughs> Back to my question earlier. Um, so does that mean um, the funds then wouldn't be available or we couldn't start the work until October 1st, 2022 for the 23 funds? Co correct. Unless there is a provision, um, I'm talking on the federal highways. Yeah, there is okay. a provision where you can request what's called advanced construction. So you would request that of the state to essentially allow you to start the project and incur costs, but you'd be waiting for reimbursement. So it's essentially saying um, this, the state has reviewed, you're, you're ready to go. And they're saying you can go ahead and um, support the project with your local funds for future reimbursement. So there's there's not usually a, a risk in doing that. It's just that the reimbursement would happen later. So that that is a provision. And for those of you who aren't familiar, it's called advanced construction. We do have some information um, in the call and links to that information on WashDOT's website. So how would that work then if we if the funds are flexed to FTA? So I don't FTA will only a flex in the in the same year. I don't think that they, they will not allow um, early flex unless we rebalance everything. But Peter, oh, Peter, you might, do, do you understand uh, where I'm going? I understand where you're going. I think I'm gonna cut to the chase of your question. <laughs> so a project that is, um, say a construction project going to construction in 2021, mm -hmm. we submit that project for this competition using pre-award authority or advanced construction, if you want to look at it, so the, uh, the expenses are eligible. Projects that's going to construction in 2021, is that eligible for this competition? Is that not allowed? Is that 
Because um, so, we're, we're, we know the funds is not available till later. Right. But the project is underway during this entire time period. Um, so. So I think I understood that. So let me. The, the fiscal year dates always trip me up. So yeah. we are awarding twenty three and twenty four dollars, and we we have had this situation a few times this year where folks competed in the last process. They were twenty one and twenty two dollars, but they wanted to go in twenty nineteen or twenty, but they were awarded in 2022 and there there is a limit to what we can do there so the state if if the funds are staying within the highway system the state will allow advanced construction for um up to one year we struggle because we we are tied to awards by fiscal year and while we have had to backfill and rebalance because of extensions we also need to honor the folks that were awarded those current year funds because they they've essentially they've been awarded those current year funds and I can't just bump them by letting someone else kind of take that slot because we do have a limited amount of available. So there's a bit of a dance there that's a little bit awkward, but specific to your question, when you compete for 2023 dollars, we're going to be looking at your schedule and your time frame for 2023. If you are choosing to move forward earlier with your project, it's possible you'd be able to do that, but just know that there's a risk because if I don't have a slot available for those funds earlier, I can't give it to you. I think the question is if you can invoke pre-award authority and you're able to float the money until so pre 2023. Pre-award authority is not going to help you with a highway dollar. It, it will. And well. So that's what question is. Can we not only, only in the sense that, um, and I think this is this is accurate. Pre-award authority will only apply if you flex the funds over to FTA. No. Pre-award authority is invoked as soon as the project's in the STIP, you have the appropriate environmental done, and you have budget. Those three things allow transit agencies or FTA funded projects, which eventually would be, to incur costs that are eligible for reimbursement later. So the question is, again, a project that will be hmm. started or even completed by 2023, as long as we don't request a funding for reimbursement later, is that ineligible? Are we really looking for projects that are occurring in the 23-24 time period? So I've not actually been asked that question in terms of WashDOT allowing that before. Um, when we talk about the highway funds, it's usually WashDOT saying it's the one-year float for advanced construction. I don't think I've posed a question to them about. We can follow up later, but I think that's a, yeah. a question about timing your projects since these funds are okay. so far out in the future. And Up till now, that has not come into play. So we've been doing a lot of, of rebalancing, and that particular issue has not come into play. In general, for transit agencies that are awarded highway dollars and they flex to FTA, washed up will only allow that to happen in the current year. So I understand what you're, where you're going, but we haven't specifically laid that out. So I will, I will look that up, but I think it's still a good question for now that we've confused everybody else in the room. Um, I think it's still a good, a good question to note that these funds are 23, 24. There is a potential that you could access them earlier, but I can't guarantee that. So you're gonna have to be strategic about which projects you submit and just know that you either are going to need to float those local costs for a while or get um, concurrence from the state to allow that to happen. But I can't make you any guarantees that you will have be able to access those funds earlier than October of 2022. So cut it out, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, so I just want to take a minute to talk about the last bullet point there too, this regular monitoring and reporting. Um, so first I want to make a plug for the Project Delivery Summit. Uh, this was one of the first components of this. Uh, it was held back in December 2019. Um, and at the summit we heard from our partners from Washington and FHWA on the requirements of using uh, federal funds, uh, specifically FHWA federal funds. Uh, I want to note that that, that summit, the, the summit was recorded, the slides, the recording, and the Q&A from it are all available on our website. Strongly encourage everybody to, if you haven't seen it, to view it before you apply for funds. There's a lot of useful information in there. Um, another part of this uh, regular monitoring and reporting, uh, we've 
with the updates to project tracking policies, we have new a new uh, process in place that we're referring to as project reviews. Uh, this is so in addition to our regular twice a year progress reports that are required, uh, we also uh, work to more closely monitor projects that are at greater risk of delay. So we've uh, we've put together a list basically of all the projects programmed in the current tip that haven't been obligated. And we look at progress reports and look through uh, project milestones and um, in co consultation with WashDOT, look to identify projects that uh, we worried that we're worried that might not be able to achieve the obligation deadline and we we monitor these more closely um, so that we're we're able to better respond to uh, potential delays um, and better prepare to make sure we're still able to meet our delivery target if those delays do happen so with this we have these regular check-ins that happen at the regular countywide meetings uh, we just started them we had our first round of them at the january countywide meetings um, and it, it basically is just a way to check in on these projects um, to, to see where they're at. Uh, and this would be something that would be expected uh, if you're awarded 2023, 2024 funds. Uh, we'll be looking at those projects the moment they're entered into the, the new tip. Um, the, the emphasis is more on the current year projects. So you probably won't be having a lot of reporting at those countywide meetings until we get to 23 and 2024. Uh, but I just want to make sure that everybody knows that this is a new part of our uh, project tracking policies. Um, but the, the overall goal of this is just to make sure that we educate and encourage more realistic and feasible schedules um, from the beginning and to make sure that we're not building in um, extensions into project schedules when you're applying for the funds. Um, we're also working to make sure we're meeting our targets so we don't risk losing our funds to, um, to other areas. And then we're also trying to make sure that we're positioning the region to be able to um, take on additional federal funds if and when they become available. So this updated project tracking policies are included in the project tracking material or are included in the call for projects materials on our website. Um, I also just want to take a moment to note that these updated the updated extensions are only going to apply to projects programmed in 2021 and beyond. So current year, if you have 2020 funds programmed to a project right now, the previous extension policy applies. So it's the one time six month extension going out to December 31st. That still applies for 2020 funds, but everything beyond, including the funds for the 2023 and 2024 process that this competition is awarding, um, the new extension policy will apply to those. Uh, so here's a schedule for the project selection process um, and the development of the 21 through 2024 regional tip. Just going to read through it here briefly. The policy framework was adopted in uh, this past January, and the call for projects was released on February 3rd. Uh, we're having our workshops this week. This is the first one. We have three more um, in each of the other counties. Uh, February through July 2020 is uh, when we're conducting this project selection process and then uh, making recommendations to the board in July. It's important to note uh, look at, we have a calendar on the call for projects materials. Uh, if you submit an app uh, or app, um, applications that are submitted, you'll be coming in to give presentations to RPEC um, on that project at their meeting in um, April. Yeah, just uh, I, um, these folks may not know who that group is. So oh, we sure. have a, for the regional highway competition, we have a committee. It's called the Regional Project Evaluation uh, Committee. The four countyways each have their own forums. For FTA, we have two committees, the Regional FTA Caucus and the Transportation Operators Committee. So depending on which, we, Ryan mentioned early on, we have four concurrent processes. So depending on which pathway or multiple pathways, you will have different, um, different processes, different deadlines, and a different committee to work with. But all of that, we'll walk through some of that in a moment, but all of that is also online. Thank you. Uh, so then in September, uh, the the recommendations will be opened up for public comment um, for the draft 2021 through 2024 regional transportation improvement program which we refer to as a tip um, in october we'll be seeking board adoption of the of the tip um, and then it will go off to the state and then on to the feds for approval so as a service for applicants psrc provides an eligibility screening review to ensure projects are eligible to compete in the process and to provide early comments on elements such as scope budget plan consistency uh, project project readiness etc uh, this allows sponsors the opportunity to correct uh, any issues prior to submitting the final application um, so we have here the the deadlines for each of the four processes 
Um, just to note that the, for the countywide competitions, they have each have their own um, deadlines, so you'll want to look at their call for project materials for that information. Um, but so once those screening forms are submitted, PSRC staff will review them, we'll provide comments, and we'll get that back to you in time so that those comments can be included into the final application that's submitted. Um, so then we also have the grant application deadlines listed here. Um, again, the countywides each have their own um, deadlines, and so you'll want to refer to their call for projects materials uh, for that information. And, and once we have those call for project materials, we'll also have those included on our website. Um, so they'll be able to be found there once, uh, once we have them. So the number of projects able to be submitted into the regional competition is limited. Um, there's a total limit of 36 applications. Uh, six applications are submitted from Kitsap, Pierce, and Snohomish uh, countywide forums. Uh, King County has 12 that are able to be submitted. Uh, there's Sound Transit, WashDOT, and the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency each can submit two. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the policy focus continues to be the support for regional centers and the quarters that serve them. When completing the application for the regional competition, there are different sets of questions depending on uh, how the project supports a center. So there's these three categories, uh, whether the project is in a regional growth, is supporting a regional growth center, is supporting a manufacturing industrial center, or is um, a quarter that is serving one of those types of centers. And so we're gonna dive in in a minute into the criteria um, for each of those three different categories. Ryan, before we do that, so we've shifted now. So now we're gonna spend time focused on just the regional competition for highway funds. But before we do that, we went through a, a lot of information on the overall process. And I'm just wondering if there's any uh, initial questions on any of that, on any of the policies, the countywide process. You you could give this workshop. Why are you asking me a question? <laughs> I'm contributing. <laughs> Um, for those, I'm also um, the chair of the King Countywide Committee, and um, for those interested in um, competing to be in the PSRC's FHWA Regional Competition, that process is already underway in King County. Um, applications were, screening forms or early applications were due from the sub-area boards about two weeks ago. Um, applications are due to compete in that regional competition on March 9th. Um, for us to compete, conduct a competition to get down to those 12 applications that are listed there. So if you want more information on that, please um, uh, stop by and drop me your card or, or contact Kelly or Ryan. They'll get you in contact with me after that. Um, and then for the countywide process, just a quick plug there. We expect a call for projects for the countywide to go out on March 1st, uh, which will have additional details about um, the process at that point. So. That, thank you. That was very helpful. So Ryan's going. I think Ryan has one more slide on on some of the details of the regional competition. But um, just to just to know, even if you have um, already participated or have missed the deadline for the King County slots, the information we're going to go over on the criteria still definitely applies. So um, as Ryan mentioned early on, the criteria applies to all of our processes. It's tailored for the countywides, but hopefully. The information that we're, we'll talk through on the specific criteria will still be helpful no matter which pathway you're, we're choosing. I have a, a question um, on so many different uh, directions to take. Do, do applicants typically apply to multiple uh, multiple opportunities, say countywide and a regional, or? They, many do. I, I wouldn't say it's an overwhelming that overlap, but um, especially for the projects that would be eligible for the regional competition here, they will often also compete in the countywide process. Thanks. Uh, so again, for the FHWA regional competition, there is a cap on the amount of funding that can be requested um, with each application. Uh, the cap is set at 50% of available funds by year by funding source. Uh, so for CMAC, the funding maximum request allowed is $7.38 million. And for STP, it's $4.92 million. <clears throat> also, just a few reminders, uh, sponsors may request funding for a single phase or preliminary engineering plus a subsequent phase. So right away in construction, um, but you can't, oh yeah. Um, what if it's um, we're looking at um, applying for construction plus um, adding equipment purchase like buses? Is that 
allowable? Or could we lump it all under like a construction phase? That is a great question. I'm going to have to. I, it's also an unusual question. Um, I think we had this come up last cycle. So let me take a look to see how we handled that. Um, it, it's generally there. I, I want to say my initial reaction is they're generally all lumped under implementation. OK, but if, it, if there's an actual capital component for construction and an equipment, I think I need to take a look to see what we've how we've treated that in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, so then also just another reminder that uh, phases must be fully funded with the PSRC funds um, and all other funding sources. So once you have these PSRC funds awarded, the phase can't be partially funded. It has to be fully funded um, with these PSRC funds and, and the local and other funds that might be a part of it. Um, so at this point now I'll hand it over to Kelly who will walk us through the FHWA regional project evaluation criteria in more detail. Thank you. And we have a question from the phone. Um, someone's asking how the process applies to nonprofits. Um, nonprofits can't compete directly for these dollars. They will need to get a public agency sponsor because these are federal funds and you have to have that um, grantor responsibility. So if you're a nonprofit interested in this, you're going to have to find a, a public agency who's willing to partner with you and submit that project on your behalf. That is different if you're um, Ryan mentioned earlier, Leon, that we have um, some other uh, funding competitions and the special needs transportation funding in particular. There is a nonprofit role there, but that is the only one that um, has that kind of exception to finding a public agency sponsor. Okay. So once I think Mitch is probably going to be the star of the show once he actually gets into the system and shows you everything on the website. Um, but Ryan's talked about the regional project evaluation criteria, and we do have three specific categories of projects, whether you're located in a regional growth center, you're located in a manufacturing industrial center, or you're on a court or serving one of those. And the criteria are all very similar amongst the three, but there are slightly different pathways. So you would select which project your project location, yeah, location your project is on, and then follow those particular um, criteria. The criteria, as we've talked about a couple of times, it is focused on center development, uh, user benefits, circulation, safety, system continuity. We have policy criteria. We have technical criteria. The policy criteria is where there are slight variations depending on which pathway you chose, but the technical criteria applies to all of them. And I'm going to go through kind of a quick highlight. I'm not going to read every bullet because we have a very robust um, criteria document, which we encourage you to read. But what we'd like to spend a little bit of time this morning going over is just kind of share with you some tips that we've learned about what we're looking for and how you can be most successful. Um, and this is our horrible chart showing, um, depending on, it gets a little complicated. We not only have three pathways of types of projects, regional growth center, regional manufacturing industrial center or a quarter project, but the funding source you request also matters. So it's, um, you are gonna select if you're competing for our surface transportation program funds, which are very flexible, or our CMAC dollars, which are not. Um, CMAC is much more heavily weighted on air quality and not every project is eligible for that. So there is a bit of strategic thinking that you all have to do to determine which funding source um, you're going to apply for. We do have um, amongst the oh so many guidance documents we have on our website, we do have some guidance on giving you some examples of what generally will tend to score very well under CMAC in terms of types of project. So depending on the project that you're interested in, we encourage you to read that and, and determine if you think you're going to do well and your project has a, a high potential to reduce emissions, you might consider CMAC. If not, um, while air quality is still a criterion under STP, you might consider that as a more flexible source. It's more flexible, it's also more competitive. So it's just, the, these are some of the, the fun strategic thinking you have to do when you apply for federal funds. So I'm gonna go through this at a fairly high clip. I'm gonna touch on first the policy criteria. I'll walk through the regional growth center, the manufacturing industrial center and the quarters. And I'm just gonna give a, a little bit of flavor of, of how you can be most successful. Um, a couple of reminders, you're probably gonna hear us say this often. And this is, I think, we had a, a bit of a, a light bulb go off recently about uh, just when we were answering questions. We see a lot of good projects. We see sponsors tell us how good their project is, and no one disputes that. 
the problem sometimes arises is that it's not just enough to have a good project. You have to have a good project that meets this criteria. This is a very specific set of criteria. So the first tip is make sure you're addressing each and every one of the bullet points. They all carry weight, they all have points, and um, it's important for you to really take seriously the criteria that's in front of you. The policy focus is support for centers, and that is how that is designed. So just as some examples under the regional, if you're a project and you're located in a regional growth center, the first questions you're gonna be asked is how your project is supporting the development of that particular center. So again, it's, it's not enough to, in these questions, tell us the benefits of your project. There are questions that are specifically designed to talk about how your project is actually supporting the center itself. So talk to us about, you know, each of your centers, there should be a plan. And what does that center say? What are the housing and employment um, activities going on in the center and how is this project supporting those? There are specific plans and policies called for in your center. It might be that your center calls for this particular project. It might be that the center calls for um, types of investments to support the center and this project fits very well in line with that. Those are the types of things that you really should be, be looking at. Um, supporting uh, supporting the new or existing jobs, it's really, you need to understand what is going on in your center in terms of housing and employment. You need to know what your center plan says because that's how these questions are designed. Um, under the Regional Growth Center, you're also gonna talk about how the project benefits the center and circulation. So this gets a little bit more at the more traditional um, transportation project benefits. So. Is there a specific problem that this project is trying to address? Um, when we talk about user groups and vulnerable populations, I'm gonna spend a little time on this because this has been, a, it's a really important uh, component of our criteria and folks don't always provide the information that's actually addressing the question. So user groups, it's, it's commuters, residents, commercial users, freight, and the populations we're talking about, low income, minority, seniors, uh, people with disabilities. So what we've seen in the past is, we, and we, we have um, a guidance document, no surprise there. We also have a resource web map where you can zoom into your project area, you can see the demographic data, you can see what else is going on in the area. So on this one, my tip here is don't just tell us the demographics of your city. Don't just say that there are seniors in the area, it's really about, that's important information. If you have that data, that's great, but tell us how this project is supporting them. So it's not, again, it's about how the project is benefiting these populations, not just that um, there's 10% seniors in throughout the city. On the circulation components, again, it's this is, I think, you probably don't need my help here because this is the traditional, you know what your project is solving. Is it addressing a safety issue? You're providing um, new access, you're filling a gap, you're doing something that is benefiting the circulation within the center. So again, it, it, keep in mind, this is all about how the project is supporting the center, not just that it's a, a great transportation project. My tip on, on safety is, um, I think sometimes in the past we've seen projects, uh, project sponsors answer the safety question to say there's no current accident problem. That could be. So if there is an, a current um, accident location or something like that the project is addressing, certainly tell us about that. But if there's not, you can think a little bit broader. Um, we know that sometimes projects are just simply bringing facility up to current standards or there are other features of the project that will make that um, uh, travel a little safer or provide you know, separations or what, whatever that might be. So think broader beyond just there's no current accident locations and really think about how your project, um, even if it's not solving a problem today, it's preventing a problem in the future. Um, in general, uh, be specific to the project benefits in the project area making connections to and from the center. Don't provide responses that are really generalized and talking about the city as a whole. I think that's really gonna um, help you fill out the, the application. And now that I've said all that, I'm not gonna repeat it for each of the other categories, but for they're very similar. The, the criteria are very similar throughout the three pathways. Um, for manufacturing industrial center, they're very similar questions. The difference is that this has a bit more of a uh, freight 
focus because these are these are centers that are focused on manufacturing and industrial areas. However, each of those centers also has a center plan. So get to know where, where the, wherever this project is, get to know that center, what's in the center, what are the plans for the center, what are the policies calling for in that center, and how is your project fitting within that? Presumably, that's not going to be a heavy lift because there's a reason why you're proposing this project to begin with. You just need to tie it to this criteria. Similar questions related to um, how it's supporting jobs, how it's pro providing benefits to different user groups. The user groups in this case might be more commercial than residential, and that's fine, but just really tell us what the how that project is benefiting it. Um, again, and mobility, accessibility, very similar questions, but a, there's a, a bit more of a component related to freight movement. So how is it improving those opportunities? Again, is it solving an existing problem? Is it preventing a future problem? Is it improving mobility, reducing idling? Is it filling a gap? Is it is it providing safer um, modal shifts or, or separation between modes? Um, and throughout each of the policy criteria, there's also a component talking about, is your project providing active transportation opportunities? So is it providing sidewalks, bike lanes, um, bus stops, what, what have you? Next one, final, oh, yeah. Is there, are there updated resources for population and employment information for the regional centers? Um, we have our regional demographic information in the web map. Whatever the center's plan includes is just whatever the, the last adopted center's plan is. But our regional demographics um, for all of it, I think it's block group based, is in, is in our web map as well as in the resource document. Uh, next one. The next one is the corridors policy criteria. Again, very similar theme. How the pro so this these are generally projects that perhaps are outside of a center, but they are on a corridor leading to a center. Every cycle, I get the question: um, How far away can you be from a center? And we don't have a strict rule about the distance away from a center. It's really up to you to make the case. Um, we've had successful applicants in the past where on a map, it looked like, wow, that project is pretty far away from a center, but it was on a critical corridor and they really made the case about how that improvement was benefiting folks getting to jobs in that center or the delivery of goods to that center. So really, it's up to you to um, make the case based on how your project is supporting these particular criteria. So you're still tied to um, how that project is benefiting that particular center. So again, get to know the activities in that center, get to know the policies in the center. Um, very similar uh, questions related to everything else I talked about in terms of the user groups, the various populations, um, addressing equity and health, active transportation, um, safety, you're, you're solving some kind of problem. There's a reason why you're submitting this project. It's a good project. Now you just need to tie it to the, the criteria at hand. So then moving on to the technical criteria, um, every project will, will respond to these questions. The first one is air quality climate change. Um, it's more heavily weighted for CMAQ, as we've mentioned a few times, but it still is a, a fair amount of points for all of the other competitions as well. And this is really how your project has the potential to reduce emissions. And there's a variety of ways this can happen. Your project can be uh, reducing actual trips by uh, in, uh, inducing a mode shift to either to transit or to bike ped. You can be reducing vehicle miles traveled by shortening trips. Maybe you're sending cars to a park and ride or maybe you're providing a shorter route. Maybe the project is improving travel flow and reducing idling. So if, it's, um, if there's a, a choke point and you're going to improve the travel flow and particularly if you know, knowing, knowing some of the details in your project area and on the facility, for example, the percentage of heavy trucks Improving, um, reducing idling of heavy trucks it has a strong air quality benefit. So get to know what's happening in that project area. Um, you could also be a project that's um, converting vehicles from, uh, for example, diesel to um, hybrid or electric. We have lots of materials on this as well. So PSRC has a technical tool. We will score all of these. Um, the more information you have on your specific project, the better. 
It needs to be properly sourced, so it has to come from some kind of study or traffic analysis or EIS or survey. And if you don't have that information, that's fine. We do have national and regional defaults, so we can uh, we can estimate the benefits, but the more precise to your project, the better. Um, so we will use the tool. It is available for you if you want to play with it, but we also have a guidance document. So you can just kind of see, again, getting back to being strategic as to which funding source that you want to apply for, because for CMAQ, this is the heaviest, the, the highest um, weighted score. The guidance document will help you. You can, it, it'll provide various ranges of potential emission benefits from different types of projects. So you can gauge whether or not, you know, consider what, what your project is doing, look at that guidance document and say, you know what, it's, it's okay on air quality, but it's not super strong. I might be more competitive on STP. Um, sorry, before we go on, so for CMAC, um, several years ago, and because it's in federal legislation, for CMAC projects, and this is only for CMAC projects, it's not just about the magnitude of potential emissions reduction, there's also a cost effectiveness component, and you can see the formula there. Um, it's about how much money you're requesting, the emissions that you're reducing, but also the useful life of the project. We do have some resources that we will draw on to estimate the useful life of a project. If you have... Um, Different project information you want to provide to us on the useful life, that's fine. Again, just make sure it's sourced and it has to come from something that we can say, okay, yes, we will we will use that instead. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ryan because we never stop talking about project readiness. Yes, um, so this is continuing on with the technical, crit technical criteria. Um, but for project readiness and, and the financial plan criteria, we're essentially looking to see that the project will be ready to use the PSRC funds um, by the requested date. This includes seeing that there is a feasible schedule to meet all the project milestones needed to obligate the funds on time. Uh, we're also looking to see that the project budget and financial plan are reasonable and that finan the financial documentation shows that the funds are secured or reasonably expected. So you can find more information on what it means to have secured or reasonably expected funds um, in the call for projects documentation. It's uh, listed in the financial constraint guidance. Uh, some also some key reminders. Uh, and again, I know I've reiterated, reiterated this several times at this point, um, but honestly, we can't stress them enough. Uh, you can only request a single phase um, or PE plus the subsequent phase. Um, phases must be fully funded with the PSRC funds and uh, funds must be delivered by the June 1st of the program year. So either June 1st of 2023 or June 1st of 2024, depending on which uh, year funds are awarded. Ryan, it might be worth chatting a little bit about when we say the phase requested must be fully funded, it's, it's the package of the award amount you're requesting from us, which is somewhat limited, and all the other available sources. So maybe spend a little time talking about the, since we're, we, I know we've got the question, since we're programming in advance, what it means to be secured or reasonably expected? Sure. Um, well, so secured would mean that you actually have the funds. You have, um, if they're local funds, you have a budget document showing that they are there or that um, uh, if it's state funds, you have an award letter or some other kind of source of documentation showing that these funds have been awarded to the project. Um, again, as Kelly mentioned, because we're programming so far in the future, it's not always easy to have that, especially with local funds, with budgeting. Um, don't usually have an approved budget for 2023 and 2024 at this point. Uh, so what we're looking for is to be able to provide information that shows that those funds can be reasonably expected. Um, providing documentation of funding that's, that you have in budgets today that you can show would be, you know, it's reasonably expected that that same funding will be available to be used for this project in a future year. Um, I don't, is there anything else you can? Um, this one, this one's a little tough because delivery is so important and we want to make sure that you have a reasonable financial plan and that it's not just don't worry about it, trust us, we'll find the funds. We'll be ready when, when you need us to go. I think the one kind of hard and fast rule we have is don't include some other grant opportunity that you are going to try to pursue. We're not going to consider that reasonable. You can certainly still pursue that. That's not a problem, but we need to have the backup plan. So when you're coming to us and requesting federal dollars, whether it's 23, 24, whenever it is, we need to see the financial plan and that you're essentially, you're walking in and you're committing that we are going to use the funds and we are going to find the dollars. So come up with how you're going to fill that with local or if you already have other grants, 
something like that. But if you tell us, it, we often we'll get the, well, TIB, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go pursue TIB. TIB can't fund everyone. So we encourage you certainly to go compete with TIB, but tell us what your backup plan is if that, if that other grant doesn't come through. I think that's, that would be my only other tip. Um, again, I also just want to make a plug for the Project Delivery Summit. Great information in, the, uh, in that recording and those materials uh, that will be useful for um, developing your project milestones and making sure you have a, a feasible schedule um, to meet this criteria. Uh, we've also put together a list of tips for completing the applications. So the first one, um, be sure to be clear and concise. Provide a clear scope of work that explains how the funds will be used and, and establish a nexus between what the project scope is, like what is the project doing and what the benefits are um, that the, and, and how the problem is being addressed. How, how what, what problem is this uh, project trying to solve? Make sure that you're thorough and answer every question. Um, please do not cut, please do not cut and paste the same uh, answer over and over to the same questions. I want to remind everybody that there are actual humans scoring this and we have to read through every one. So it does not do you any favors to cut and paste the same thing into every, into every uh, response. Uh, also, don't assume that the scoring team knows your project and the project area. Uh, the scoring team will not do additional outside research to learn about to learn more about the project. Um, so make sure you're providing maps and graphics and photos uh, to help illustrate your project and its location. Provide data and documentation of community input uh, to document the needs for the project. Your chances of success will improve if you can paint a clear picture of what the project is and how it addresses the problem. That being said, please only provide information relevant to the project location. Um, again, humans are scoring this. So, um, it, uh, again, humans are scoring this, but so, um, I guess basically what I'm trying to say is we don't want to sift, we don't want you to attach a giant 300 page document and, and then think that the information in that is something that we're going to be able to pull out exactly what, um, relates to this project. If you're going to make a large attachment in your, in your screen for, or in your um, application, be sure in the answers to specifically cite, hey, we've, attached, we've made this attachment, go to this section on this page, and this is how it relates to this question. Um, we're not going to go through and try to pull that information out on our own. Um, I've also said this again numerous times, at the, uh, numerous times, but remember that the policy focuses for the support of centers. Uh, it doesn't matter how many benefits your project provides, as Kelly mentioned, if it's not meeting the eligibility criteria, it won't score well. Uh, also, just in case I haven't made it abundantly clear at this point, <laughs> um, developing a feasible schedule and financial plan is critical. Uh, I'll make, again, one last plug for that project delivery summit. Um, but there are, there's some great um, slides in there and uh, Stephanie Tax in her presentation, she gives uh, some good rules of thumb for how you should plan out. Here's how much time is realistic to do this phase. Here are the challenges that can arise uh, that need to be accounted for. Um, so again, if you haven't taken a look at those materials, um, you, I highly recommend doing so before uh, submitting an application. So at this point, I'll, I'll get off that soapbox and uh, I'll, we'll hand it over to Mitch who will walk us through the online resources. And, Just uh, uh, really, one last thing I would say, um, kind of going back to the, the first bullet point, and we've, we've had this theme and in, in the theme of kind of explaining what we look for and what's going to be most successful, we see a lot of applications and there's a lot of great information about how wonderful your project is and why, you know, the justification and why it's necessary. And that's all great but we're not gonna use it unless it ties to the criteria. We're only awarding points based on the established criteria and how your project is meeting that. So you can tell us all sorts of wonderful things, that's great, but just know we are being, we are really strict about, we follow the criteria. So really pay attention to, to that and focus on those bullets. Okay, so. Sorry, um, I'm Mitch. I'll be um, discussing the online resources for this, uh, for project selection, as well as the screening forms and funding applications. 
So at the PSRC website, um, we also have provided this link in the presentation um, for people to look at after afterwards. Um, we have the call for projects information, including the schedule, um, the workshop flyer, and the framework for PSRC funding. Um, some highlights here include um, the regional designated centers map um, and the supplemental uh, FTA supplemental agreement. Um, so if local agencies would like to apply to FTA funds, they need concurrence with a transit agency and this form allows you to do that. Sarah, do you have anything to add? Okay. Um, and then the criteria and resources section, um, we have the project evaluation or regional project evaluation criteria and the resource and then the main resources tab. Um, some important things to note here are the checklists uh, for the various forms and applications. Um, this link will lead you to the project selection resource map. Um, so here you can, for instance, select a city or the area of your project. So we can go to Auburn, for instance, um, and it should zoom. Um, and then, oh, it's an issue. So um, we have the legend here and you can select uh, various components that you're interested in, such as uh, if you're looking at freight routes, um, you may be interested in the air quality focus communities along freight routes. Um, near regional growth centers. Um, so if agencies want to use this map for their application, they're welcome to. And if they want to screenshot this and use it into the, with their application, you, you're more than welcome to as well. Um, I think I'm having some issues with the screen, but usually refresh. refresh. Yeah. Well, usually. There's a button right here that says more information. And if you click that, it'll have a description of all of these data sources and the definitions of them. So that can be helpful uh, when using this tool. Um, so this is a very useful uh, tool for your application. And Mitch, if I can, if you would click, why don't you click on um, poverty population? So there's the map, so you can actually look at where your project is compared to this mm -hmm. but we also have a document that talks about for particularly for the question related to um, equity and vulnerable populations we walk through each of these layers and talk about how you can use them to answer that question all right thank you just a question about the tool is there a way to select multiple cities or it's just one uh so the this just allows you to zoom into the area uh that and from here, you can zoom in closer or further. Um, so you would just have to scroll around the map. Um, okay. Um, so then going back to the main page, uh, we also have some documents related to uh, guidance for financial documentation um, and financial plans, um, as well as tools and documents related to air quality. Um, Mitch, can you spend a little time talking about maybe open up one of the, so the checklists are kind of the cheat sheet for the information you're, you'll need both on the screen, eligibility screening form as well as the application. So you can look at this before you go into the system and see there's there's um, some helpful information in here and then just in terms of what, what you'll be needing to provide. Yes. Um, so for example, this is the screening form checklist for the FHWA competition, um, and this is very helpful um, for agencies to review before they complete their forms um, to ensure they have all the information required. Uh, and again, you're welcome to look through this and contact us if you have any questions um, throughout the process. I welcome. We kind of mean strongly encouraged. Yes. <laughs> Please review this information. <laughs> um, and likewise, here's the Federal Highway Application Checklist, um, which is very similar. Um, and then here's the- We have a question in the back. Oh. There's, there's no text limit, is there, on that online? 
<laughs> what? <laughs> um, Ryan, do you want to take that? Sure. For the, so I think one issue that we see a lot is we have a section focused on the project scope, and then we have a section focused on the uh, purpose of the project. And so um, what we see a lot of times is people in their scope will try to include the benefits of the project. And in that area, we are specifically only looking for what is this project doing? We do, it's, this isn't, that's not the place to put in the benefits. Uh, you want to do that in the project's purpose. Um, so for that, for that project scope area, we do have we do have a request to keep that below 300 words. You want to think of that more in lines of if you were programming this project into the tip, what would the description of it look like there? Um, so there we have a limit, but elsewhere we haven't we haven't created that limit. Other than you know, I'm, I'm gonna I, I love how Ryan said there are actual human beings reading this. So just because you write more doesn't necessarily mean that you're answering the question better. So to the extent you can just be really pointed and direct and concise. That's great, especially in the, you know, where you're selling us on in the criteria. Tell us as much as you need to tell us, but in that front matter, um, especially on the scope, the one thing I would add on the scope is this is where, um, what is the project doing and how are the PSRC funds being used? So if it's a multi-stage project, but our funds are only going to be used on a portion of it, really be clear about that. I also wanted to add on the project scope. As we said earlier, we want to be clear and concise, but we also really want to get a clear picture of what the project is. Having been on a few scoring committees, I know that sometimes we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the project is and what it's doing. It sounds wonderful, but what is it? Where is it? <laughs> you know, answering some basic questions. So that should be really front and center is ex a clear explanation of what the project will be doing. Well. Say 300 words or 300 characters? Words. <laughs> um, and so, moving on, so we have. Hang on, Mitch. Hang on, Mitch. So if you scroll this a little bit, you have an air quality tool. Yes. Um, so earlier you mentioned that, you know, looking at the um, how your project scores on the emissions is, is key. Uh, is there somewhere on this site here saying, Historically, projects that have scored 80 and above are high scoring for, should be considered for CMAC or, you know, I'm trying to get at some sort of point of no, reference. No, we don't because agents. the, the, every competition is going to be different. So the, the final scores, all the projects are compared against each other. So we can't say for certainty that a project that scores this amount is going to get funded because we might have a competition where everybody scores below 70, but the air quality guidance document does provide where I was mentioning earlier for different types of projects at different scales, the general emissions benefit. So you can kind of gauge which are the ones that are that tend to be um, more robust when it comes to emissions reductions and which of the ones are are um, kind of on the lower end. But we can't tie it to any particular score because that's going to change every cycle. Yes, Kirsty. Um, maybe going to talk about this shortly, but I can't remember when it comes to the point of finalizing your uh, list of projects and you're considering geographic equity and all that, is there, is there an intention to try to have a mix of MIC, Regional Growth Center, and Corridor Serving Center projects? Um, so, so what Kirstie is asking for those of you who might be new to the process, so the, the scores are a bit sacred, you know. This is this is the the box. This is the closed room where we are very strict and rigorous and as fair as we can possibly be to come up with a score for projects that are meeting the criteria. But that's not the end of it because then we bring those scores to the committee, and the committee is the one that makes the recommendation. So during that recommendation process, um, before they get into any debates, the committee will talk about what are the other factors in addition to the score that will be used to make the recommendation. And we, we make sure that everyone agrees on what those are before then the recommendation happens. As Kirsty mentioned, generally geographic equity is a big one. We have not ever had a particular focus on making sure that we have a project from each category. It's certainly something that the committee can talk about. Um, I think it depends on oftentimes the I think the majority of projects we see are generally on long corridors. Um, if we have high scoring projects in all three, it's likely that would happen. But you choose the three pathways, but then the projects are ranked 
just you know one through 36. So it's something the committee can talk about, but we don't have a specific um, goal for that. Okay, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, lastly, or well, second to last, we have the countywide competition section. So as we get information related to each countywide process, uh, those will be located here on our website. Um, and then we have the applications and screening forms sections. So if you click this link, it will uh, take you to the screening form and funding application uh, webpage. And to log into that, you use your same TIP uh, login credentials. Uh, so now I'll run through the screening form. So again, for the for the sake of folks who might not know what that is, each I'll I'll try it, but you you correct me. Each agency has a specific login. So um, if you don't have access to that, somebody does. Right. Okay. <laughs> and if you, and, I think yeah. if I don't know what our protocol is for giving those out. Yeah, if you if someone just needs to email or needs their credentials, you can email us and we can send you the credentials easily. Um, so here's the introduction page of the screening form. Um, so at this point, you can select which uh, competition you're uh, compete or you want to compete in. We're going to go through the FHWA uh, path. Um, however, it is important to note if you are competing for plan to request uh, or sorry plan to compete in the FTA uh, preservation set aside you sh you will select the FTA earn share um, option um, anyways so you'll select your competition um, and go to the next page and it's important throughout this uh, application or screening form you'll want to click the save next button so this saves your progress throughout the application so if you want to uh, complete some of it and start it and finish it later on those pages will be saved um, if you get to a page and you don't click that save next button that page will not be saved um, so that's important to note um, so this is just so the next page is just general project information project title um, this is very straightforward. Um, one thing to note throughout the screening form and funding application, we have this odd glitch um, on, on uh, questions that ask yes or no and highlight which um, activate uh, preceding questions. If you, so if I say yes, it's blank. And if I say no, it activates this question. Let's say I choose Auburn. If I click save next, and realize Auburn was not the correct choice, it grays this out until you click yes and no again, and then you can update it accordingly. Unfortunately, this is just a glitch that we haven't been able to fix, so I just wanted to note. Ryan, are we going to fix that? Ryan. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's just important to note, because um, I imagine that'll cause some frustration. <laughs> Um, and then moving on, we have contact information uh, for the applicant. Um, we also have the project description and location. So at this point, you will specifically just list the components of the project scope. We don't need to know the purpose or justification at this point. Um, this also includes project location. Um, so this is all very straightforward as well. Mitch, just to let them know, so you're cheating because I you've already cheating. filled this out and you're clicking on the next one, but you have to click save next to get to the next screen. Right. So you won't be able to yes. pop ahead because if you miss something, the system won't let you keep mm -hmm. going. Correct. Okay. And as you uh, move through the application, uh, this essentially table of contacts will show up and you can go back to whatever tab you need to if you need to edit something in the or previously in the application. Um, but you cannot skip ahead unless it's filled out. Um, and then at this point, we have the federal functional class classification of the project. So you can select this um, using these bubbles or these options. Um, and throughout the application, we have 
um, uh, links to various resources and guidance, uh, and also contact information to the uh, relevant staff. Um, and then there's the bike and ped accommodations, um, selecting yes or no if this is a part of your project and the type or types of uh, bike ped um, uh, facilities included. And if you do not have, or if the project does not include bike ped, you'll have to explain um, why not. Um, moving forward, you have the plan consistency uh, question, uh, whether it's in a comprehensive plan, and if not, explain why not um, and where you can, or and how this is relevant. Again, sorry. <coughs> how much detail do you guys really want there? I mean, as you know, some of these plans you can list a bajillion policies. So it's. Um, Again, be concise and direct. So it, the easiest, Mitch, if you'll scroll up, scroll up a little bit. So the projects have to be in or consistent with a with a local plan. So if it's specifically identified, that's great. We don't need the whole comp plan. Just put the citation. And if it's not, you know, just find the relevant policies that are called for. We don't need a book. We're not going to read the book. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, and then moving forward, we have the project readiness page. Um, so this is kind of getting into the project timeline um, and milestones um, related to uh, PE, environmental documentation, and right of way. Um, so you can fill that out accordingly. Um, and the next page is the actual PSRC funding request. So this is what you're funding or what you're requesting from PSRC in this competition. Um, so you, uh, you'll be asked uh, STP or CMAC, um, as well as if you've uh, applied to PSRC fundings previously. And on the next page is where you actually list the phase amount requested and the year of dollars you're requesting. Um, so it's important to note, which we've mentioned many times, it should be one a single phase or PE plus a phase, um, and the phases that you're uh, requesting funds for should be fully funded. And I think it's true. We even though so I can afford a thousand dollars, so that's a great project. But these are not in millions, so put in the full mm. amount. Okay. <laughs> I also would just want to add too that you put in the year that you're requesting, but just because you request it doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to be awarded. Right. And then continuing on this. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. The next page, um, we ask for the total project cost. Um, so this is the complete cost of the project, not just the phase that you're um, requesting. So. Uh, in this case, um, I list PE, right-of-way, and construction, and you're also asked for, um, so the funding source, uh, the status of funds, the amount of funds in all of these phases, uh, as well as the expected year of completion of each phase, um, and lastly, the expected project completion date. So a couple of tips here. Um, we need to see the total project cost. It's a federal requirement, but let's say you're only asking for design dollars. We need the design financial plan to be pretty tight, but just an estimate in construction, you don't, it doesn't matter if you don't have a financial plan for construction yet, but if you have the rough estimate and you can call it local, you're not going to be um, evaluated on that, but we need to have this completed because we have to have the, the, the rough uh, total project cost. So don't, if you're asking for design, Total project cost is not just design. That's right. Does this apply for planning grants as well? Because uh, that would be hard to cost out. No, a if grant. it's just a planning study, if it's a planning phase of a capital project, it would apply. But if it's just a planning study, then planning would be the whole project. Okay. Um, and then continuing on, we have the financial documentation page. Um, so at this point, you can leave a description of your financial documentation that you're including, and you can upload as many files as necessary for your documentation. Um, 
examples are TEIS um, pages or local TIP pages um, related to the projects. Um, this is a common issue we have, um, so please make sure you provide complete documentation because we this is a common follow-up item. Um, Kelly, you have anything to add? Yeah, no, that was exactly what I was, I was going to say. This is by far, whether it's the monthly TIP amendments or the grant applications, this section is by far the one that generates the most follow-ups. I think your goal, my goal, probably isn't your goal, your goal should be to have the um, least amount of PSRC staff follow up on your project as possible. So <laughs> provide us the backup documentation. <laughs> Um, and then, so then you'll get to the final review page and this, you are not done. Um, you, <laughs> you have to click the submit button or else it will not be submitted to PSRC. Um, so just make sure to actually click submit or else your application will not be seen technically. Um, and if you have it, and at this point you're free to navigate through these tabs and go back and edit any information if needed. Um, and if you have any issues, you can contact Catherine or myself um, at these emails. And so once you hit submit, PSRC will be notified and we'll be able to review the screening <coughs> form. Um, you'll also be sent an email that provides you with a PDF of your copy of the screening form. Um, and also one thing to note, this view download PDF link is here throughout the screening forms and applications so you can click it and you can print you'll get a copy of your pdf um, at any point if you want to do that um, in the process um, so at this point psrc will review your screening forms um, and provide feedback uh, for the applicants and then at that point you'll be able to submit uh, funding applications so if there's no questions now, I'll go into the funding application portion. Bob, you look poised for a question. Are you are you holding? I always struggle with the financial documentation. Okay. Uh, is it okay just to uh, show a surplus and we have because technically I'm not authorized to spend that money. Uh, Ray, maybe help me out here. I, I think so. So again, since we know we're we're programming in advance, what we're looking for is, you know, if you if you have funds available to the project, that that's great. We'd consider that secured. So show us whatever budget or or other document you have or grant form or something. But for the funds that you might, um, you, you think either it's a recurring funding source or surplus, like you say, what we're looking for is um, identify the source and then tell us more about um, why it's likely that it's gonna be there either from, um, you've had historic success um, having that funding source or you you know it's, um, I'm just making stuff up now. There's an ordinance that says this funding source is continued through 2030 or something like that. Ryan and Mitch, what other types of documentation might we be looking for? <laughs> I think it's really just making it clear, like Kelly said, to make sure that you're um, just trying to, you know, connect the dots that yes, the, this is why this funding source is likely to be there in the future. And it can just be like this, the source has been one that we've been using for this type of a thing for the past 20 years. And, you know, we fully anticipate that it will be there for this, you know, it's that kind of a thing. That and it, it could be, so there's the budget, but then there's also the capital facilities plan and the six year tip and anywhere where there's funds identified and then whatever other documentation that says this is, this is an actual real funding source that the city has available to it. And I think we've, we've had, you know, historic expenditures or historic revenues available that will continue into the future, that type of thing. Anything that can just lock it in a little bit more. Um, oh. <laughs> And one general uh, tip to add with financial documentation, um, when you're, if you do submit like a local tip, please highlight the specific funds or project that you you want us to review um, instead of just giving us pages and pages of funding documentation that we have to sift through. Is there a preference just instead of submitting the full document, just pull that and make sure we reference on top with a note, this is from this document? That would be ideal, <laughs> yeah. Or, or even a web link and saying, look at page 
seven, yeah. <laughs> you know, something yeah. like that. Is it possible to get a just a blank PDF download so that you can preload it, or do you have to fill it out before you download it? We don't have a blank form because it's built into the system, but that's why we had the checklist that kind of lists list out everything that we're asking for. Um, but I don't think we have the fully fully formed blank because it's it's in the online system. I was able to download a blank PDF just okay. so you can do it. Yeah. So you, you are able to do the the view download PDF, but it doesn't give you all the detail that you see on the screen here. It's just basically here's the sections, and if you have filled out a response, it'll include that response. If you don't have responses in there, um, it's not going to give you it's not going to give you the full complete PDF. It's only going to give okay. you to what you filled up up to all that right, point. Thanks. Um, and then, I mean, the complication with that too is that there's just so many different pathways, especially with the application, that it's just not realistic to provide that kind of a document and on paper. Mm -hmm. The good news, which I think Mitch is going to talk about next, is once you've, this is just the screening form for Pete's sake, but once you filled out the screening form, there's, you don't necessarily have to carry everything over into the application. Mm -hmm. So you'll walk through that. Yes. Um, and one thing to note for screening forms and funding applications, say you complete it and submit it to PSRC and you realize there's an error that you'd like to fix, if you can contact PSRC staff and we can return the application to you and you can go in and edit it again. Um, I know that that could be an issue. Um, and then as long as you submit it before the original deadline, uh, we'll honor that. Uh, but anyway, so once you have the, for, uh, the screening form submitted and PSRC has reviewed and given feedback, uh, what you can do is when you log back into the screen, the project selection page. So, um, so this is what you see, and you can click screening forms or funding applications. Um, you can go to the funding applications option, um, and you just using pre-populated or sorry, uh, yeah, pre-populated um, uh, funding applications. But when you start your new funding application, you'll click new funding app. And you have the option to pre-populate your funding application with the screening form information. Um, so this will save you a lot of time. Um, so you can click this option and select which uh, competition uh, you'd like and the screening form based on the project title. Um, and then this uh, lists which project or application type you're um, competing for. Um, so we can just do uh, growth centers and then you click next. And then this is the beginning of the application, the funding application. And so for instance, like your project information is already filled out. Um, and so you kind of can just skip through a lot of this information because it'll be pre-populated. Here's my caveat is that's assuming that the information you put on the screening form to begin with was all accurate and complete. So um, we strongly encourage, so that's why we have the screening form process. We're going to review it and we're going to provide comments back. We're certainly going to flag any significant eligibility issues, but if we have other information we would like for you to maybe address before you submit the application, you will see our comments. So don't, don't get too um, swift in pre-populating and moving on, please do review and make sure that you are updating and catching any of those errors so they don't carry forward into the application. It was, um, I begrudgingly went through the, and, and let the pre-population happen, but that's my, that's my caveat, is just make sure that we don't want an error carried through, so definitely right. um, do your due diligence and review our comments and just double check everything when you, once you're actually at the point of submittal. And I'd just like to add a uh, couple other things here. Uh, one is that we have to have reviewed the screening form before you can use it to pre-populate. So you won't be able to just complete the screening form and immediately go to the application and pre-populate. We have to actually go through and do our review and accept that screening form before it'll show up in that, that drop-down list as one to pre-populate your application with. Um, so if we haven't been able to finish that review yet, um, you'll have to either wait till that review is done or you'll have to, you won't have the pre-population feature and you'll have to re-enter in everything. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that when you're on this screen, um, once you fill up, select that project category application type and move on to the next screen, if you, if you realize that you made a mistake and maybe you picked regional designated centers and you meant to pick the quarter supporting centers option, you can't go back and change it at that point. You have to just start a new application. And you can still use the pre-populate feature and use the same screening form to pre-populate it. Um, but there's just no way, because that's like, that selection is what picks which trajectory this application uses to, to fill out the, the different fields um, for the questions to answer. So you can't go back and undo that. You just have to start a new application. The other thing I wanted to note is um, right now you're only seeing the regional. Once the countywide calls are out and those applications mm -hmm. are available, that will also um, be a feature here. I feel like there was one more rant I was going to give, but I, I've lost it. So I'll come back to it. Kelly, I think I want to follow up with you for our countywide process for regional. We do use your online system, so I'll make sure that our project sponsors can use it and not be held up with the uh, greeting forms not being released or whatnot. So. We can talk about that. Sure, one sure. To make that, that comment. Yeah, and that actually, I wasn't a rant. It was a helpful tip. Um, the screening forms, we are review, We will review them as quickly as we can and turn them around to you so that you'll have plenty of time to take a look at those and review them before any application deadlines. Great, thank you. Um, so once you pick your application type, you will be sent to the screen. So technically the beginning of the funding application, um, which starts with the project information. So assuming there's no uh, errors in your screening form, you uh, this will be pre-populated um, and you can continue on through the uh, application. Same with contact information. Project description, the project scope should be filled out as your screening form, assuming there's no errors. Uh, this will be left blank and you'll have to fill this out. This is where you list the project justification and purpose. Um, so you can give us those reasons as to why uh, your project is important um, and needed. Um, and the project scope will remain strictly the components of the project. Um, and then this is the, again, the same project location page as the screening form. And the project, um, oh, sorry. The, this is the same plan consistency page uh, as you saw on the screening form and federal functional class. Um, this is the first new page really uh, where you list the support for centers um, describing how this project supports the center or corridor um, leading to the center that you chose. Um, and then this is where we get into the actual criteria um, for the application and the project. Um, so you will just uh, complete these questions based on the criteria and guidance provided on our website. Um, I've made it a little easy for you because we've translated every bullet into a question, so it'll prompt you for an answer. Oh, yeah, and um, one thing to note with the application, it's the same as the screening form. If you do not complete um, a question, or sorry, leave a question blank, it will not let you advance. Uh, so that's important to note. Um, and this is also more criteria. One other tip that just came to mind, because I think we have this example, putting NA in one of the criteria bullets is not going to get you much of a score. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yes, or XX. <laughs> uh, it was a very low scoring score project. Uh, and there's also more criteria, um, which is again uh, noted in the guidance. And then at this point, you hit the air quality criteria. So depending on your project, you will select one or multiple elements um, that's relevant to your project. And depending on which uh, element or elements you click, or sorry, select, um, those will send you to different uh, questions um, that you'll have to answer. Um, so that will have a bit of a varying effect on your applications. Um, so for instance, I chose roadway improvement. And so it sends me to this uh, page for specific questions related to roadway improvement. Um, and then you just fill out these questions and continue on. Um, and at this point, there's a project readiness page, or the same project readiness page, I should say, asking for the request information. Um, so you have the type 
of funds, and then you list out the phase amount request and, or, I'm sorry, amount requested and the year. Um, this should all be pre-populated, assuming you don't have to change any errors. And just to, so I've, we have gotten this question. So the screening form, um, we will review the screening form for eligibility, but if you want to change something in time for the application, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. So if you want to oh, update yeah. your request or if you have better total cost information, that's completely fine. And if you want to make other changes, that's also fine. But if you're changing significant components of the project like the scope, we're going to have to review that again, but you are certainly welcome to update the um, the requested amount, the phase or the financials. Yeah, and that's regardless if we provide feedback. Yeah. Um, uh, so, okay, so we have the request, the funding request on this page, which should be pre-populated. Um, and then this is the estimated project cost, total project cost and schedule. This again will be pre-populated unless you need to make any edits. Uh, and the funding documentation is the same as the screening form, so that should all be, um, all remain the same. I believe we were sneaky enough that if you pre-populate, you'll also see our comments in the same area. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like having my voice in your head, even while you're filling out the application. I hate to be ignored. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, one thing to note, the attachments that you uploaded in the screening form will also carry over to the applications with the pre-population feature. So um, that makes it easier. Um, and then moving on, so this is a new portion of the application that's not on the screening form. It's just more specific questions about project readiness. Um, depending on what, uh, what phases your project includes, um, you will see different uh, pages, so you might not see construct the construction page, or you might not see right away if you don't have right away. Um, but anyway, so you have the project writing SPE page, um, which just gets at milestones related to PE, um, and then another one for NEPA. So, um, Mitch, oh. is, it's true that these are based on um, which phases they're requesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if you're requesting PE, you won't necessarily see the later milestone questions. Oh. For right of way or right. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So then you have your the NEPA page, which uh, this pre-populates this portion if you already submitted it in the screening form, but you will still need to select the actual type or level of documentation here. So just that's important to note. Uh, and you'll also get an error if you just try to skip through this, anyways. Um, and then here's another right of way project readiness uh, page. So if you if your project does not include right of way, you would not see this. Ryan, would you like to um, provide any helpful tips about the challenges with right of way? I would say, again, if you view the project delivery summit materials, you'll find a lot. There was a a lengthy discussion in that um, during that summit that talked about um, challenges that, that, keep, uh, that keep creeping up into um, this phase for projects. And she, Stephanie provided very good um, kind of rules of thumb for how much time to give yourself um, and, and not to assume that uh, elements like TCE, temporary construction easements are going to be simple and quick. Um, uh, there are now things like I think in that she was referring to that we need to be planning a year for those um, just now because it's did just become more complicated. Um, so again, I would make that plug for that project delivery summit. Yeah, don't um, we can't stress enough. Don't us underestimate the time that's going to be needed to get through your project, particularly if there's right of way, no matter how simple you might be, if you are working near water or near railroad. So just um, Assume more time rather than less. Um, and then moving on, we just have a project readiness uh, page related to construction milestones. Um, so 
more of the same. Um, and then uh, the next page is other considerations. So these are other general questions related to the project. These will not, so my understanding, these will not be scored, but if, but could help. And uh, Kelly, just answer it. Yeah, so the um, they're not part of the scoring process. The board has requested them and the committee or the board could choose to consider them in the final recommendation. But um, if there's anything else, this is your opportunity to have anything else you'd like to tell us about the project. Okay. And then lastly, we have the final review page. Um, and again, just click the submit button um, for it to be sent to PSRC. And we can, as always, um, send, uh, or sorry, return your application if you request that and need to make some edits. And as long as you resubmit it before the deadline. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the process, you can contact us. Um, so yeah, I think that's all for the funding app tutorial. Okay. So we have about 10 minutes left and then we're going to start the FTA portion of the uh, uh, workshop. But if you have any questions about the process, if you have any questions about projects, um, you can take some time and ask us now or feel free to reach out to us. The one thing we, we are always able to answer questions, provide some information on what we look for in the criteria at this stage in the process where we can't sit down with you and talk about your specific project. But if you have just more general questions about any of the criteria, don't hesitate to um, give us a call, give Peter a call. April. I may have missed this. So for the King County wide, uh, for the regional competition, the application, the screening forms due on March 3rd, but it's due uh, March, the app is due for the regional process on March 9th. Will we see your comments before we have to submit? I think Peter wants to talk to me about that because you guys have a unique process to select your 12, which is a bit problematic in terms of the, the process. So <clears throat> what, is the, what is the selection date for you? So we have um, uh, project presentations on March 16th, so we would need the comments by then to be addressed as part of that process. So you wouldn't necessarily need them by the 9th. Um, we can do that. We can do but that. But by the 16th, as we go through them, if they're, I mean, they're all perfect projects. So I don't know why there would be a problem. <laughs> but yeah. um, if there are any questions, we would address them at that, at that point. So something upwards of 12 to 20. We can, we can do that. It's only a couple of weeks. We can do that. Any other questions? Is there any um, update available on the status of the 2018 contingency list and funds available? So I knew that would get a good I know, <laughs> I know. Um, so the first hurdle was we did a, um, at our board request, we did a survey of all of our projects with PSRC funds to see if they were going to be impacted by 976 because we wanted to um, check to see if that was something that the board, if we had an issue in meeting our delivery requirements, if the board wanted to use some of that, some of those dollars, we are um, presenting that to the board on Thursday, and we don't think that that's going to be necessary. The next piece of the puzzle is how many extensions we might um, get for 2020 funds to see what the draw is. So I'm hoping, as I've said from the beginning, we had a few additional steps we needed to go through, but I'm hoping there's a spring action. Um, so by the end of this month, we'll probably have a better handle on it and we'll be talking to RPEC, but I'm hoping for a March or April distribution. The question, so there will be a distribution. The question is right now figuring out what year's funds they're going to be. Because what what will, these are, these are additional funds to the region, but we have to kind of sort through where everyone is um, in the current years, 20 through 2022, to see where we might have a, a, a hole to fill before deciding what year they are. Thank you. All right. Oh, yes. So we were thinking of going after street preservation funds, which if I'm right, has a $1.5 million ask. Um, my question is like some people were talking about including like a little bus pad as a sort of build out, but that's not technically part of the actual street. Is that something that would be included for funding or not? Sure. I'll let Peter kind of give you the details. So the preservation set aside, we set it up fairly strictly to be um, roadway preservation. They go through the countywide forums, and I don't know if the countywide forums, if any of you have allowed the additional work outside of preservation. So if there is an existing, so a quick answer is if there is an existing bus pad there that needs to be upgraded, 
then that's part of the overlay. Basically, we have an overlay program or a crack seal program in King County. Um, so if it doesn't fit those categories, then um, if you're improving the road more than that, that probably would be questionable. Um, and we would have to have a talk about that at our next countywide meeting if that is something you guys are are interested in doing. So we're finalizing our our call for projects uh, this month. But you could compete for that in the regular competition, just wouldn't be part of the set aside itself. Correct. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Again, we're available for questions. We're going to transition to the next workshop, but give um, Ryan, everyone else left Ryan, but give Ryan or I a call if you've got any questions. <laughs>